humanist 
who once memorably said that he considered an audience laughing as close to the divine as he could yeah. understand. And he worked from that level creatively. But we should start the conversation with the word enclosures to come, which is a very important term for getting out of the, let's just call it the neoliberal consensus or the American consensus for how a market society works. Because enclosures helps us start to talk about the pathologies of, uh, of capital, which is off the table in mainstream discourse. And so enclosures is about what capital does in, in, in claiming the commons. Because the commons is an unowned resource that nobody owns, and therefore it's free to take. It's free for the taking. It's the whole history of, uh, of colonialism, because nobody had deeds. Well, the English enclosure movement, which many of you may know about, in which the landed aristocracy took over shared pastures and forests and, and water, uh, forcing everybody to move to the cities and become paupers and very slaves, is now replicating itself in Africa, where there's huge international land grab by hedge funds and sovereign investment funds, uh, displacing people who have lived there for generations as indigenous people or subsistence people, uh, setting up a future for famines uh, and the same urban problems that we saw before. I want to give an overview of some of the range of enclosures going on. Rainwater in Bolivia was briefly considered private property owned by Bechtel and the World Bank, and they took over the Cochabamba municipal water supply in the early 2000s, leading to social up, uh, upheaval and riots to basically reclaim a shared resource. You couldn't collect rainwater off your roof because that belonged to Bechtel. 20% uh, of the human genome is currently patented yeah. and privately owned, which has profound consequences if, for example, you're a Utah a company that has the breast cancer susceptibility gene, which means you can prevent others from doing research in that area without uh, threatening to violate their patent. And this is replicated across all sorts of uh, living systems, where you can now own living systems, not just bacteria, but clones and laboratory animals, Harvard owns the Anko mouse, patented, etc. So a whole frontier of enclosure. Uh, it's, enclosure is not just privatization, it's the turning something that was shared into a commodity and dispossessing the people whose cultural identities and practices were based upon that resource or revolved around that resource. So you know it's it's very extreme. So far, that there's a book called Math You Can't Use. There's an algorithm that's embedded in software that can be patented and owned, and somebody else can't use it. So it's actually mathematics that it is owned. You can't own Mick in McDonald's because people have tried to do it in McDonald's. A San Diego-based company claiming a Scottish-Irish prefix has gone after Mick Vegan, Mick Sushi, Mick. It goes on and on. Uh, so parts of our language and culture at very elemental levels are being played. Uh, in the early mid-1990s, ASCAP, the performance licensing body, went after the Girl Scouts and hundreds of other camp, summer camps for singing around the campfire because, of course, this is a public performance that should be licensed. Uh, and they, only, they had the legal right to, but only backed off after the public outrage was so large that they said, okay, okay. But they still do have that legal title under copyright. And I consider market enclosures kind of the great unacknowledged scandal of our time because it's always equated with progress and growth and prosperity and human betterment. But, of course, much of the time, even most, it's really destructive of all those non-market aspects of life, be it ecological, community, social. It's monetizing and marketizing all of these aspects of life. So, another thing we need to start off quickly and just dispense with is the commons is not a tragedy, it's a generative. The tragedy of the commons idea got started by Garrett Pardon in this 1968 essay in Science Magazine called The Tragedy of the Commons, in which he said, imagine a pasture in which anybody can put as many cattle as they want and they can graze as much as they want, it will result in, in over-exploitation and the ruin of the pasture. This is the tragedy of the commons. But of course, this was a total fanciful, non-empirical fable. But it was picked up by property rights advocates and conservatives and economists as a truism that has drilled into every undergraduate's head that any shared resource results in a tragedy. Lewis Hyde, who some of you may know, uh, puckishly said that the tragedy is the tragedy of unmanaged, laissez-faire, common pool resources 
with easy access for non-communicating, self-interested individuals. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, of course, if you have neighbors in an area, you talk to each other, you negotiate, you work it out. And in South Amherst, which is near me, this is how we solve this tragedy of the commons. We put up a sign that says, no horses on the commons. I'm joking, of course, but you know, it's, it, there are ways to prevent the tragedy. And yes, over-exploitation of resources occur, but that's not really a commons. That's an open access free-for-all. And uh, standard economists like to <coughs> conflate an unowned resource with the commons. Now it took, well, just to stress, the, the commons is not just a resource, uh, as Harvey would have it. It's a community with social norms and practices for managing the resource. So it's kind of an integrated bundle, as opposed to simply this inner physical resource. And it took Professor Eleanor Ostrom, uh, an Indiana University uh, political scientist, to, over the course of her career from the 70s to the 2012 when she died, to empirically rebut Hardin and to amass hundreds of examples, mostly in developing so-called developing countries, rural uh, contexts, where farmlands, fisheries, forests, water, wild game were successfully managed uh, as a commons. And she wrote a famous 1990 book called Governing the Commons, which in a sort of social science, dense social science way, explained the principles of successful commons. There were eight major principles. Uh, and she had founded a whole international <coughs> scholarly community, the International Association for the Study of the Commons, and there's a whole tradition associated with her. But she's, she uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for this work. And I think it was significant that that was just a year after the 2008 financial crisis. They wanted someone different. And she was the first woman to win. And I don't think that's incidental to her focusing on relationships and cooperation rather than the standard male economists moving objects around. Uh, so she was just a pioneer for helping to validate and understand this at a more deeper level. Uh, however, some of us try to get to a deeper level. She was more of a behavioralist. Uh, I think there's more of a subjective, intersubjective action dimension to the commons. And Peter Leinbau, who's a Marxist historian who has written extensively about the commons, has said that in medieval times, and, and he himself has written, there is no commons without commoning. Commoning being the social practices and traditions and norms and rituals and traditions by which we develop a coherent way to manage these resources socially. Uh, beating the bounds is one way that you protect the commons. Every year, there was a festival in many English commons to walk the perimeter of the commons. And if somebody had put up a fence or a hedge to try to enclose it for private purposes, they would knock it down. And it was sort of like the community policing of their, their shared wealth and a party. Uh, very convivial. So I love the metaphor of beating the bounds as what we need to do today to protect the shared wealth. We need to find these ways to protect the shared wealth. So let me talk a little bit about varieties of common to give you some specific examples to, to give it a little concreteness. In my uh, narrative group for land, I mentioned my profound experience with seed sharing when I was at this village two hours outside of Hyderabad. And the women were essentially bonded wage laborers on somebody else's farm and couldn't afford more than one meal a day as a result. But then they had the bright idea of recovering traditional seeds for agriculture, which were more appropriate for the semi-arid region of Andhra Pradesh than the monoculture that the ag biotech world had, had foisted upon them. And they were able to grow enough to feed themselves two meals a day and to federate this project among many other villages to the extent that they were doing videotaping uh, that they shared among each other. A, a, for me, a very moving story of self-emancipation through common and dignity and ownership. And they, incidentally, they wouldn't allow their seeds to be shared, to be sold. They could only be shared uh, or exchanged, which I think is an important part of the commons of making resources inalienable to the market. Uh, there's a whole system of rice intensification, which is like open source agriculture, where farmers from Sri Lanka to India to Cuba have gone online to trade agronomy techniques 
which have improved yields by 20 to 50 percent without GMOs or pesticides or herbicides, uh, all of this without government ministries or scientists being involved. All the bottom up collaboration. I call that like an eco digital commons to show that the eco, the digital world and the ecosystems are not separate realms, they're starting to interpenetrate. In Peru, there's the Potato Park where indigenous tribes have collectively gotten a legal, a very innovative legal regime to protect the biodiversity of potatoes there. They have like 900 different varieties of potatoes, one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. Uh, but of course, the, the ag biotech companies wanted to seize the pa to patent the genetic information on these and claim ownership. So this was a significant legal innovation for them to protect their, I think it's called the agroecological heritage site. Uh, but very instructive, if only as a metaphor, for some of the issues we face. What's interesting is that there's an estimated 2 billion people around the world who are, use the commons for survival or subsistence. But because there's no money being exchanged, economists generally don't regard the commons as interesting. It's not a market regime, even though they're meeting their needs in a non-market way. So I, I find this astounding, astounding that there's not as much serious attention given to it. Even after uh, Ostrom's Nobel Prize, she's been largely ignored by the uh, economics profession. But closer to home, I consider relocal, relocalizing food an enactment of commons or an attempt to try to make uh, even if there, there might be market behavior involved, it's not capital-driven markets, and it's attempting to make these markets accountable to the social community and part of it. And there's a whole number of innovations going on in that space. There's a whole movement that's developing, especially in Europe, called the city as a comment. And the whole idea is that the moral claims on city resources and spaces starts to change when we talk about the city as a comment, because instead of investors or the wealthy or development being regarded as the prime goal for what a city should be about, you start to say, well, no, equity, equity and access of by ordinary people is the system, and that value can and is created by, the, by these people, every bit as much as valuable as the outside infusions of capital. So there's attempts to do you know, open data commons and uh, shareable cities policies. And Bologna, this is a picture of Bologna, they have this fantastic post-bureaucratic innovation of the city bureaucracy enters into public commons partnerships instead of public private, where they do contracts with self-organized uh, groups of citizens and neighborhoods to take care of a space and have formal legal authority and even financial assistance and technical assistance as opposed to just sort of dumping it off on these people. There's a, it's, it's a collaboration between city government and, uh, and commons. And I think David Graeber once, he's the uh, anarchist anthropologist, once said that the left has not dealt with its answer to bureaucracy, which I find profoundly alienating. Everybody finds it alienating. The left has no answer to that. This, I think, have the seeds of a post-bureaucratic solution in which government can work with commoners or be a partner of commoners to enable more enlivening ways of meeting needs and governing ourselves. Alternative currencies, pretty uh, robust area for trying to capture community value instead of being siphoned away by debt-driven banks. Um, so that's a whole discussion into itself. We could have. The web is like vast hosting infrastructure for self-organized commons. I don't think people realized when it first started that this was the new mo model that was being developed. That it's not, well, of course, a lot of the attention goes to the capital-driven Facebook, Twitters, Googles. Uh, in fact, there are lots of self-organized commons from open source software to Wikipedia and dozens of different content sites um, that are function as commons. There's the full, I mentioned some of these, you know, LibreOffice and uh, open access publications, Linux. There's that explosion. Uh, Creative Commons licenses are now used in more than 170 countries. It's it has allowed, it's turned copyright inside out. Creative Commons licenses, if you're the copyright holder, you can say, I'm going to put this license on, which means my work can be shared uh, in advance for these, in these ways. There's about six basic licenses. But the point is to make that uh, in advance, in perpetuity, shareable. So it's a legal hack 
around copyright law, which is otherwise quite hostile to sharing, uh, as many of you may know. There's a whole access uh, scholarly publishing movement, with almost 10,000 journals that are, don't have copyrights, or they use Creative Commons licenses, so academia functions as it should in sharing its knowledge, especially since a lot of that knowledge is taxpayer uh, finance in the first place. The whole movement to make college textbooks you know, if you've, you've probably encountered these artificially new editions year after year, so you have to rebuy the textbook and you can't share it. Community colleges, where a lot of students drop out because they can't afford textbooks, has spearheaded an effort to make textbooks shareable uh, as, a, as a commons. And it's sort of like academia reclaiming its mission instead of being, uh, what shall I say, the host for parasitic companies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the open source movement has like exploded in a whole new frontier. Is there's all sorts of global design networks with local production, which I think is the seeds for new types of, of local production that's more ecologically benign. There's Farm Hack, a major figure of this is in New Hampshire, but it's a global community where they've designed dozens of different types of, of agricultural equipment that have no patent on it, it can be locally sourced inexpensively, and it's sort of uh, in you know, more creatively, and you don't have to buy a John Deere. Uh, it, so there's profound implications there. Fab labs, you know, Barcelona has more than a dozen specialized fab labs, which is arguably the rudiments of a different kind of local production system with uh, leveraging off of open source. There's Arduino, electronic circuit boards, there's even a Wikispeed car that's designed at open source principles. So a lot taking off there in pure production. So as this, but I want, let me move to another stage now. Uh, you know, as somebody who came out of the Washington world, I approached the commons initially as economics, policy, and politics. But I think ultimately, it's, a, it's about world views, which is where this conversation in the morning starts to connect with the commons. First, let's dispense with this. I mean, most people regard politics as a debate between too much state or too much market, and what's the proper balance? Both of which ignores that there's a vast amount of generative activity through the commons that is simply not discussed, not named, not considered realistic mm -hmm. as a way to accomplish uh, the meeting of human needs or self-governance. In other words, we can have, we can meet our needs, we can govern ourselves in ways that the, the mega state allied with the market. We, we can bypass that through commons the way a lot of local food systems do, the way Linux has, the way Occupy in its short life, or maybe I'm going to like this probably. But the commons also is about ourselves in our whole the richest full dimensions. It's a world making system that's in its own right and right. And I I've had only learned this in the past several years that this subjective dimension of common aim is as important as the resource management the way economists talk about it. And it really is a different universe of value. And it's about relationality, especially, uh, and how that works out. And these are some of the principles that I regard as, as important to the commons. about meet, meeting basic needs first instead of market wants. It's about long-term stewardship, responsibility, entitlement, fairness, inalienability. Rulemaking by the people from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down. Those are some touchstones for thinking about the commons as a different framework of value. And to try to communicate this, I, I sort of like, how do I convey this, especially to Western audiences who may not get it? And I came to con uh, once a uh, conference, this woman who showed a slide of the African desert. And this is, of course, how we Westerners would conceive it. But the indigenous people sort of draw the same map that way. And it's like, it's a work of art. It has their human reality and spirit embodied in how they perceive and navigate through the desert. And I think that's an important lesson about the commons, is that this whole wealth of inner life that we were talking about this morning uh, is hugely generative, regenerative, enlivening aliveness. And that's what the commons, for me, is ultimately all about. Even though, of course, we can and must talk about it in the policy and economic realms as well. But the other thing that happens along the way to the commons 
is that familiar, no, you can't see that too well, familiar dualities blend, blur, the rational and what I call the non-rational, not the irrational, the objective and the subjective, the collective and the individual, the public and the private. They all start to mingle and blur. And these are almost, those dual, dualisms are artifacts, I think, of the 20th century and even the Enlightenment, which is precisely part of the problem. Uh, that we don't acknowledge our whole holistic selves in an organic way. And the commons helps us uh, start to grapple with that and name it. But that begs the question, what then is the ontology of the, the commons? The economics says we're homo economicus. We're rational, utility-maximizing individuals. That's who we are. But of course, okay, so what is a commoner? Well, I don't say I have the answer, but my colleague of German activist Silke Helfridge and I uh, wrote a book, or edited a book called, called, called Patterns of Commoning, uh, which contains dozens of examples of successful commons. And we built upon the, the, the ideas of Christopher Alexander, who is a, an architect who wanted to know why are certain public spaces and buildings so humanly satisfying? <laughs> And he developed this whole idea of pattern languages, which is the accretion of certain practices over time find their way into certain patterns. And certain patterns are, persist because they're so satisfying. They meet our inner needs in deep ways. And this is a result not of any a priori taxonomy or analysis, but of social practice of actual human beings. And that's sort of the model that Silk and I took for patterns of commoning, that the, the ontology, the, the basic way to understand commons is through these emergent patterns. Uh, we, we are inspired a lot by complexity theory, which is a, a science-based system of studying living systems. How do living systems self-organize themselves? And I think that there's a lot to be found through patterns. Interestingly, evolutionary science is starting to discover cooperation mm -hmm. in the commons. I've been in touch a lot with uh, David Sloan Wilson, who has been trying to apply cooperation principles that he discovered through evolution, and he worked briefly with uh, Eleanor Ostrom before her death, trying to apply that to neighborhoods and civic environments. And I'm not sure where our conversations might go, but I think there's something important there. Evolutionary scientists also are starting to realize, it's a controversy still, but many are saying, natural selection occurs in a collective basis, not on an individual basis. Which leads to the saying, quote, selfishness beats altruism within groups, altruistic groups beat selfish groups, everything else is commentary. <laughs> and very interesting, you know, so there's some really serious thought going about uh, in thinking, rethinking evolution. My own personal guru on this is somebody who's maybe a little bit more far, far out there, but is no flink. He's a biologist, theoretical biologist, and an eco-philosopher in Germany. He's only published one book in English, and I've met him through my associations with people in Germany. But he wrote this book that came out last year, Aliveness, Feeling, and the Metamorphosis of Science, Biology of Wonder. And he um, reinterprets with empirical research that's breaking right now the whole Darwinistic narrative, not to sweep it aside and rebut it, but to show that um, the core aspect of evolution is not uh, nasty competition only, that the core aspect of life that he sees in all living phenomena from small bacteria on to ma mammals is the, the need to develop creatively and adaptively one's identity. And his subspecialty is, I love the term, biosemiotics in which there's this communication and meaning that is exchanged through Earth. In fact, I recently saw an article recently of how trees and forests mm -hmm. communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And so he is studying this quite seriously, but the problem is he's kind of a pariah within mainstream evolution because he wants, he thinks, and argues quite persuasively in this book, that subjectivity, spirituality, meaning, consciousness is an active force in evolution. It's not a side, it's not a peripheral uh, epiphenomenon. It's something that, and right now, our consciousness and spirituality's work as it is, is altering the earth. It's having 
this biophysical impacts. But he argues this not just in the global sense, but in the very micro uh, test cases of how uh, it's not as if bacteria have consciousness, but they do have a sense of adaptive building their, their uh, identity. And some would criticize him for having a telos, an end point. But he considers creative emergence to be an important part of the story of evolution which interestingly is an important way to whole, rewrite the whole uh, free market narrative based on a nasty, brutish, and competitive notion of, of evolution, which evolved during the Victorian era of, of industrialization, sort of has, and has become the, the, un, the, the accepted substrate for how we think about free markets. Free markets work the way they do because they're based on Darwinism. You know, there's this twinning of Darwinism and free markets. But, uh, Andreas argues that there's this social, cooperative, symbiotic, holistic dimension to evolution as well that needs to be heard. The mainstream doesn't really want to hear about it. But so he argues for a first-person subjectivity science and argues for a biopoetics, the title of one of his other books, and has an essay contrasting the Enlightenment and says we have to move to the Enlightenment. Uh, so, for me, it's kind of a mind-blowing uh, way to reinterpret a lot of things because it's based on a, a heterodox interpretation of evolutionary science. But I sort of wanted to dwell on that for a moment because it takes a while to uh, absorb that, but I think it's of profound importance. Let me just quickly, I have a few things here, and I guess I have a, a, a seven, but I want to scoot through a number of things that I regard as practical vectors for how we start to support commenting. One, stop the enclosures. This, of course, is a matter of resistance as opposed to generating comments, but that's sort of a key uh, priority. Second, recognize commenting as a regenerative paradigm that opens up entire new solution sets. Once you start to tap into people's moral creativity, trust, reciprocity, creativity, solutions become available that otherwise are within the old framework are just not seen as credible. We have to reinvent law for the commons. This is one of my pet current, more than a pet, is one of my current priorities. Uh, because the prevailing system of state law is philosophically hostile to the commons, mm. because it focuses on private property, market growth, individual rights, and doesn't recognize collective activities or the generativity of it, most law that protects the commons is a hack. The way Creative Commons licenses or the general public license for software are creative hacks around the law. They're not systemic alternatives. But I wrote a memo last year that itemized five or six dozen areas where people are trying to hack the law, from cooperative law to indigenous peoples to contract law to property law. And I think we need to start talking about this as a unified body of law to advance the commons. A longer discussion. Same thing about reinventing finance for the commons. Uh, most money in finance is based on bank, you know, banks create most of the money in the world through loans. Uh, government has basically given over the authority to create money to private banks. So one reason we have trouble dealing with the ecology is that uh, debt-driven lending creates this growth imperative. Um, a longer discussion, but the point is we need to devise Commons friendly forms of money and finance. Another mega concept, but there are serious people working on this. We need to leverage the sharing and open networks to support commoning, to get beyond the Uber and Airbnb extractive predatory models uh, of which they basically they are parasites in social sharing that extract value instead of regenerating value and allowing the people who are sharing to keep that value. We need to rethink structures of state power to decriminalize commoning and support commoning. You know, the idea of commoning being criminal goes back to witches. Witches in the medieval times were criminalized and persecuted precisely because women were disproportionately dependent upon commons for their subsistence. And when they enclosed them and the women would continue to use that, those resources, they would be persecuted. And we see this with Lots of sharing online and other areas where, where you know, they're trying to prevent uh, farmers from sharing seeds. There's, Europe has a whole new initiative on that. So 
we have to decriminalize comedy and affirmatively support comedy, and that requires us thinking, well, how should the state behave? Another big topic, but there's some serious thought on it. But maybe a counterintuitive thing I've learned is we need to learn to live with ambiguity, paradox, and experimentalism, because we're in this transition. And we can't, we have to build within our hostile structures. And so, of course, we're going to have these paradoxical feelings, and we're not going to be pure. Everything's going to be a hybrid. So, you know, it's a question of how you maintain the integrity of the vision while working in a hostile system, as opposed to being vulnerable to co-optation. So, art and survival. This, I don't have many slides in this because in some ways, this is the discussion I want to have. But I do think that art is very much about expressing authentic human experience and realities, which is so important. And implicitly, therefore, it's about resistance. And it's also a way of envisioning, it's a way of imagining and envisioning a new world. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, equally, there's all these alternative economic movements that sometimes are overly cerebral and cognitive or embedded within political and policy structures and can't back up to what is the human condition that we're trying to ameliorate? How do we express that? And I think that's where art has an enormous role to play in an authentic way. And I think many of these movements would welcome those kinds of alliances to help them reimagine, uh, as well as getting the power of art with, without, I might add, it becoming propaganda. Always a trouble when art becomes alive or involved in political issues. So, I see art and culture as about new ways of speaking from deep places which will indirectly, and sometimes directly, have profound political economic consequences. But we need to speak from those places with a sovereign voice. Um, and that's where I think a lot of exciting synergies and magic will occur. Um, these are my books. This is my introduction to the Commons, which um, I, I consider, I'm proud to say that it's been translated into seven different languages in the past two years, which I'm proud of that, but I think it's more indicative of this kind of international interest and energy in the commons as a way for reconceptualizing a post-capitalist vision in a positive way, so it's not just anti-corporate, but in a creative, constructive way. And I think that's what a lot of us, that for me was the appeal of frankly moving beyond naturism, uh, of starting to see some of these constructive alternatives that are incredible. Um, these two books, by the way, are both available online for free if you if you care to chase them down, wealthofthecommons.org and patternsofcommoning.org. Uh, so, and with that, I guess we should move in. I, I don't know if, what, what next, if I answer questions, are we going to our groups? Or? <laughs> make some space for some Q&A in a large group before going on to the next conversation. Yes. Um, our end time will still remain. Yeah. I think there's, okay. Yeah, we can take, you know, 10 minutes Great. for that. Let's go. I just wanted to maybe call on uh, HowlRound to talk about how you built on these concepts, the, the comments uh, that is HowlRound. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, partially by by accident, partially by just what was in the air, partially by um, you know, Todd's kind of unearthing of Zelda Pitch Amber <laughs> and getting to know the work of uh, David Belair. And, um, you know, I think uh, in a way, you know, the HowlRound platforms are, you could say that they're very much like an open source software project in that. Initially, it was a, a small group of people who came together to um, to address a certain set of problems that we had in the theater field, and then it evolved into this open call for the theater community itself to produce on these platforms, and and then this kind this kind of implicit management system started to develop out of that, which is the agenda, the conversation, 
the ideas that are shared are, are all um, that agenda is set by the community of people who choose, who step up and want to participate. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the essence of this particular knowledge commons, HowRa. Uh, and, and so all the platforms operate from this idea of peer production, all for the benefit of everyone who's participating and for the benefit of anyone who wants to have access to, these, to this resource. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's so great to meet you and to see the depth of your thinking about this. One of the things that I found particularly naughty is the, um, the kind of, well, the inexorability of the market, for one. Um, but in relation to this notion of sufficiency. So this is something that I, I was so happy to see in your, on your website because it's a word that I've been using for a while, that sense that we in this room or in any room that we gather in, we are sufficient. Mm -hmm. We have what we need. It to, is an abundance. And there's an abundance of that because we have what we need um, to make world together. Um, however, um, what we don't have, I mean, I have it. I work at a state university, but I imagine many other people in this room don't have is money to pay their bill. We, uh, many of us run organizations that depend on wealthy patrons who increasingly run the organizations over the decades of their lives and have no sense of the deeper mission or the kind of innate commons thinking that is, uh, the commons thinking that is innate to artists and collective artists like theater artists. So I guess what I'm looking for is wisdom, advice, the key, the open door to, you know, to like, how do we actually live sufficiently and spread that when we're, we're well, apart from the escapist collectives, <laughs> I think we're in, a, <laughs> we're in an agonizing transition zone. Yeah. I mean, I can't fund my own work very well through this. And I think that that's one reason there's a focus on finance for the commons and alternative currencies as a way to capture more of that value ourselves as alternative systems. In the meantime, the philanthropic world, donor angels, or it's more risky skimming off market stuff to support the commons because it slides inevitably to market orientation. Um, we're muddling through it and we're trying to invent things, but the robustness of the commons form, especially in the digital age, is being demonstrated without a doubt. The, there's a number, this is an under-theorized area. Uh, we have some instructive models like the free and open source software foundations that you know, uh, collect money, are run by the elders of the community, and then site, put to, into the community. The problem is open source has a stable modus operandi with the market without being taken over. That's a longer story. But you know, in other words, they are not as endangered by market use of open source software, whereas most commons are endangered by having too much intercourse with markets, especially with capital markets. So I don't have a good answer. For right, you. right. I can transition. Yeah. Can I say something to that? Um, I think that I, I've been thinking about this a lot for years or so. And, and I was talking to Vijay in the form in the past Iron Survival about what happened in Argentina when the market crashed. Mm -hmm. And thirty percent of the population was left, you know, uh, without a job. So there was a, a sort of spontaneous uh, barter club created. And we developed all this like it was natural that, you know, uh, an alternative currency, which actually was the thing that stopped because Citibank and a lot of banks got really scared. So they went to the government and said, listen, we need to recapture because they're they are actually they are making billions of dollars out, outside of the system. Mm -hmm. Which is why the blockchain, brief, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The blockchain software which undergirds Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a capitalist speculative currency. It's bad. But the blockchain that allows the authentication of Bitcoins through the network 
without a third party guarantor like a bank or government is like this potentially breaking of the atom because it allows self-organized collaborative uh, sharing of value on networks without any third party. Mm -hmm. So this is, and people are working on that. So. And, the, and maybe to, to summarize where I'm going, the, the, there are many steps, but what I've been thinking is that, um, that, so I've been trying to create commons and collectives since 74, 75, and uh, observing that one of the, the challenges, the large, the big, big challenges that we all have already behaviors and narratives inside of ourselves that sort of undermine our attempts to be with the other and to have a common thing. So we are taught to do things, we learn how to do things in a certain way that don't function. So as soon as, as, soon as we're trying to do commons, we get disappointed or discouraged, discouraged because you know the selfishness or the competition and all those things are already you know, indoctrinated. So then I started thinking, well, you know, we, we really need to somehow, like you said, I, I really appreciate the thing, instead of fighting in front of, uh, ha, you know, create hinges, because there's no way out of money, in, in my opinion. We, I don't think we have a way out of money. We can go around in several ways. Money has value. It's yes. It's who controls and creates the money. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because it's... So then I started thinking about exchanges, which also I learned from Stacy, and it came to mind something that an economist once said to me when we were in the crisis. Uh, he said, you know, your theater in Argentina is not going to survive because you don't have a diversified portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I was, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, what is that? So I then started researching, and somehow I feel that some of those steps we have been taking by having our food system, mm -hmm. by so embracing which is, I understand as an individual, is very difficult because you have a job. But once you start creating collective or working in a collective situation, uh, it becomes a little more accessible. Like we have a couple of cars that, that are so cooperative. Well, the first priority to answer your question directly is commons help you decommodify and reduce your dependence on yes. markets. And therefore, that's the first step to yes. back away. Creating the, and then the second step is starting to federate mm -hmm. those yes. so they can be mutually cooperative. The way the digital world of open source, open access publishing, and Wikipedia are all kind of this fraternity of mutually supportive open source. So, so, so you can get the second Carlos, degree. Carlos. So we're, I'm going to take two, two, maybe three more questions, and then we're going to move on. And we're going to keep talking. So there's a lot to say, and we're going to keep talking in these um, smaller groups. So I'm gonna, can I propose that we don't yeah. do that? Okay. We have about 17 million hours of sure. talking that we <laughs> want to all <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay, and great. We also want to give respect yes. to the subject. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think no. the proposal on the table Sorry. is to close this conversation <laughs> and move on. But we're going to move on in a way that will enable everyone to have more time to talk. Matthew. And as well as tomorrow, tonight and tomorrow, yes. 